Right. I'd like to welcome you all. Thank you so much for coming this afternoon. My name is Julie Natus. I'm the Director of Education here at the James Museum. It's wonderful to see such a, a great crowd for today's program. We're pretty excited to share this with you. Um, I want to start out um, by thanking our partner organization. Uh, today's program is the second in a three-part series uh, that we are offering in partnership with the Boxer Diversity Initiative. Um, which is, if you don't know, they're an amazing uh, small nonprofit based in Sarasota, uh, which funds initiatives designed to foster tolerance and understanding of all groups, no matter the race, religion, or gender identity. The James Museum is proud to work side by side with them to put these programs together. I would like to acknowledge Dan Boxer, founder and head of the Boxer Diversity Initiative, and Judge Charles Williams of the 12th Judicial Circuit Court of Florida, who also serves on the board of directors of the Boxer Diversity Initiative. Can you please wave, gentlemen? Thank you. It's been a wonderful partnership. Um, all, program, all three of the programs in our series are centered around the museum's current special exhibition, From Far East to West, The Chinese American Frontier. And we, we hope you'll um, take one of our program guides here um, and join us for the third program. It's, um, it's in the back of our fall guide, but it will come out in our, our spring guide. It's on January 9th, which is a Tuesday night at 6 p.m., which it's the Asian American Experience Today. It will be a panel discussion led by Dr. K. Ian Shin uh, from the University of Michigan. So please join us for that program and check our website for more details. Um, it's now my pleasure. Oh, I will also mention that the special exhibition closes on January 28th, so if you've not been upstairs to see the exhibition, please do so. Now my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. We are so pleased and honored to be joined by Dr. Anthony Lee, who flew in from Massachusetts for a very quick visit. Uh, we hope we have enticed him by our warm weather. Um, Dr. Lee is the Idella Plimpton Kendall Professor at Mount Holyoke College, where he teaches courses on modern art and the history of photography. He is author or editor of more than a dozen books, including Picturing Chinatown, which won the Smithsonian's Eldred, Eldridge Prize for Distinguished, Distinguished Scholarship. He is joined today in conversation by our own Emily Capus, curator of art here at the James Museum. Uh, Emily began man managing the Tom and Mary James slash Raymond James financial art collection in 2005. She led the transition of art from a corporate setting to the James Museum, planning the initial artwork, the ex um, planning the initial artwork, the exhibition design for eight, the eight galleries that we have upstairs. Since 2017, she has managed the museum's special exhibition calendar, including developing the current show from Far East to West, which she developed over the past two years. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to our speakers today. Thank you, Julie. Um, and thank you, Dr. Lee, for being here. Um, we're so excited that you all have come to hear about the art of encounters. Um, this interest that has, has, has been here for the exhibition um, is really um, amazing, and I'm so grateful uh, for your, con your continued support. I see a few familiar faces out here. Um, it was an honor to organize the exhibition, and um, I really appreciate the feedback and the reviews uh, that have been out. Um, we recently made it into the Essential West blog. Um, I was on Art in Your Ear on WMNF um, uh, the other day, and uh, we've had some really great press lately, so look out for the Tampa Bay Times article. I think that should be out in a couple of weeks. So. Um, I've been asked on numerous occasions if this show is going to travel, and unfortunately we have a lot of loans to return um, in February, so we're not able to travel it to other museums, but we are working on an online version, and uh, we hope to get some good captures of the exhibition in different ways, so we will continue to share it after this. Um, so it's my honor to be here with Professor Lee. Um, he selected some images from the exhibition to present and discuss today. And I'll introduce each one and, and we'll dig into some context and um, the makers and their varying perspectives. So welcome. <laughs> Let's get into it. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks for all coming today. Um, also, before we begin, let me also send my thanks to Emily and to Julie and to Dan Boxer and to Judge Williams. Uh, it's so really a wonderful show. I hope you take advantage and take a gander at it if you haven't already done so. And also, I especially want to point out the banner over here right, for the Boxer Initiative. 
Um, uh, it, you know, they're committed to telling untold stories, or perhaps frequently, infrequently told stories. And I think it's a, something that I'm certainly very grateful for, and I think we all very much benefit from. So thank you, thank you very much. Um, um, so we decided to uh, uh, have a conversation, uh, and I fear that I'm going to mon monopolize the conversation <laughs> a little bit here, where we're going to show a couple of images. Um, uh, and let me just say at the outset, uh, I chose the images from the show in the hopes of stringing them together to talk a little bit about the ways in which they fit a pattern of representations not made by the Chinese, but by others. Uh, and in doing so, I, I didn't want to in any way suggest that we should think of these works as, as somehow lesser works because of that. But in fact, by, by making them complex and by suggesting something about the assumptions and the strategies and the attitudes and the particular conventions of the people who made them, that we actually kind of deepen our understanding of the work so that when you return to the galleries, you might be able to get a sense of not only of the subject matter being, that, is, that is being pictured, but also the attitudes that went into the picturing of that subject matter. So. Okay, so first we have a Harper's Weekly illustration. This is on the first wall as you enter the exhibition, and it's called Chinese Immigration to America, and it's from 1876. Um, so within this exhibition, the image helps to represent early 19th century ocean crossings to California and what that experience might have been like. Um, go ahead. Right. So, so this is a wonderful print, early print from Harper's Weekly, and as, you, as Emily says, it's right as you walk in, it's on the right side of the exhibition entrance there. Um, and it, it tells the story, or at least tries to tell the story, of early Chinese migration from mostly southeast China to the port of San Francisco. Um, and the usual story that's told, I'm sure many of you have heard this before, is that the Chinese came, like many others, to California uh, for the gold rush, uh, and that they were hoping to strike it rich. But one of the things that we have begun to learn over the years is that Chinese migration had long preceded the trip to California. Uh, there had been many migratory trails from that portion of China, what was once known as Canton, but is generally referred to today as Guangdong. Um, and it's sort of uh, the ways in which families augmented the family purse. Uh, sometimes the agricultural economy was pretty rough, and so the father usually had a family plan. <laughs> he would send his sons, never the first son, but usually the second and the third and the fourth son, somewhere else to go and bring back money for the family purse. Uh, and over time, those pathways became pretty solid. So a family could send their son or their second son to a place in Singapore, for example, or to Western China, or God forbid, you know, Siberia. Um, uh, and it became a kind of family custom. Uh, and it also gave rise to certain kinds of comedy. Um, you know, so for example, if, if we were to analogize this for today's experience, imagine, for example, a father living here in St. Petersburg uh, and had a family plan to send his sons elsewhere to bring back money, he would send them to Boston, you know, near where I teach. Um, and it led to a kind of constant generational commute to Boston. And so the sons would get to know Boston really, really well. They could tell you how to get from the Boston Commons over to the MFA, and they could figure out how to get across the bridge to Cambridge. But ironically enough, because that was their only experience, they couldn't tell you anything about Tampa. <laughs> and so there was a way in which that kind of culture was really embedded in the Chinese community. Uh, when the British came to um, Southeast Asia and established a port in Hong Kong, the migrant opportunities expanded because steamship allowed them to go from areas on the eastern, uh, Chinese eastern ports across the Pacific Ocean. And they took that opportunity and, and traveled to San Francisco, partly for the possibility of the gold rush, but also because it fit a larger pattern of things here. And so uh, one of the wonder also wonderful things about this migratory trip was that uh, they rarely left any kind of visual trail of it. So what we're looking at here is someone's imagination about what that voyage was like. And I am so struck by a couple of things about this portrayal here. Uh, first of all, uh, it's in the hold of a steamship, which, to be quite frank, was not a very pleasant place to be. It was smelly and dirty. You kind of shared 
your space with mail and animals and other kinds of things here. But it seems to be like a, a kind of campfire <laughs> on a place like this here. And what even added to the fact that there was a kind of campfire vibe, there seems to be, in fact, a fire that's in the middle <laughs> of the ship here that's being sourced by wood that seems to be taken from the planks of the ship itself here. And so there's kind of a strange, absurdist, almost kind of co oh, compensatory gesture on the part of the maker of this work. And I, the other detail I love the most about this is that there is the befuddled cook with his apron on the far left side who is charged with feeding this enormous number of migrants there, only to be told by the supervisor that, no, in fact, you don't need to do any of the cooking because they do all the cooking themselves. <laughs> um, and it somehow suggests that there's a strange, almost chummy kind of quality of crossing the Pacific Ocean, which we know today was a brutal, brutal experience. And secondly, the suggestion that they are a self-contained and self-sufficient community is one that was insisted upon by the maker of this work as well. It, and we see that to be true in other works too. Right. It, it, it's really interesting. Um, I love the the idea of the campfire and kind of that central circle of, of people. Um, but yeah, this was a this was an example, and and it's on the Pacific Mail Steamship Company, um, and and that was the company who um, really was was had the ships for the majority of um, Chinese coming over in the 19th century. Okay, so now we have Ken Cathcart's map of Old San Francisco. This is from 1947, and um, this is framed on the wall with the earthquake information of 1906. And I, I got, came across this information uh, because of this book, and I recommend this book. It's really amazing. It takes a block-by-block -block look at the map and, uh, and the illustrations in it and gives a great bit of history um, as well as perspective. And, um, and it's, it's, it's really wonderful. So that's where I got the idea from the map. And when I was reading on it, it uh, was, was interesting. This is a complete side note, but um, the artist Maynard Dixon, um, who's featured in our early West Gallery upstairs, um, he's mentioned in this book because he used to eat at one of the restaurants that's located on the map. <laughs> So, uh, so just a side note there. But yeah, go ahead. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, switch this pretty quickly here. Um, so, the, yeah, great. As, as Emily says, this is a map made in the middle of the 20th century by a non-San Franciscan who came to the city uh, and was fascinated by the map culture that he was inheriting and also wanted to contribute to. And he did a lot of archival research in the production of this map. Um, and, and what I'm so struck by about it is that number one, it is already delimiting Chinatown as a named community in this space, separate from other places within San Francisco. And it also echoes a very, very famous map from the 19th century. So I'll show you that map right here. There you go. Um, and it's called uh, the Chinatown map. Um, and I guess I, I, I'd like to segue into this part of the conversation by suggesting that the very name itself, Chinatown, was not a name given by the actual inhabitants of the place, but was often given by, in fact, totally given by the people who visited the place. Uh, and it was meant to, I think, carry a number of associations with it. Number one, that it was a, a known and understood place with boundaries. Uh, and secondly, that it was a location of a particular kind of population. But also third, that it was the sort of place that was filled with stories and various kinds of adventures. It was a different kind of place. Um, and oftentimes that difference was one that allowed for the policing of that space, but also the kind of touristic adventures that could be had in such a space like this. And one of the things that is pretty apparent in the early 19th, or the 19th century map over on the right, and I don't know if you're able to see that from where you're sitting, but a number of the particular buildings on the Chinatown map are color-coded. And they're color-coded by being key to what are understood to be particular businesses at these places. And so what do we find? Uh, a brothel, right? <laughs> uh, an opium den, for example. And so it seems like already at the very, very beginning, Chinatown was understood as a kind of place for mysterious activities and adventures and entertainment. 
um, let alone the fact that it was, in fact, a home for many, many folks. But it was a space that actually could carry those kinds of connotations. And, and the name stuck, right? and we are inheritors of that name today. It means different things for us today, of course. But there's somehow or other this continuing sense that the space is bounded physically, but also we would say bounded psychologically and culturally, bounded by various kinds of builds ups of stories and fantasies and desires. Uh, and in the middle of the 19th century, in the middle of his research, Cathcart was in inheriting and exhuming all those stories and positioning them on a map in such a way. Uh, the second thing to say about it is that the physical space of Chinatown came about because it was, as is often the case for immigrant societies, unwanted land. Uh, the original shoreline of San Francisco was a much desired space. It was the place that was most accessible to the boats, boats that came into port. But uh, typical of early San Franciscans, to outdo each other, they began to build landfills <laughs> out into the bay. So that had once been the shoreline of San Francisco, over the course of a generation, became far inland. And it was the undesirable leftover areas of San Francisco that became the place where the Chinese community established itself. Uh, and so you might even be able to see in Cathcart's map the area just to the left of the words map of old San Francisco that's kind of outlined in red there. Um, and that red portion is the landfill area that was once in fact water. <laughs> and Chinatown was kind of pushed in, inland into that space, the undesirable space, but in, in, in terms of Cathcart sensibility, the central space there of San Francisco itself. And when we think about the audiences for these maps, it's, is it tourists, even, even with the, the earlier one? Yeah, for tourists and also for um, uh, the police ah. right? and for uh, supervisors. Okay, yeah. Well, and it seems like the, the map of old San Francisco from 47, it seems like it's, it's such an illustrated, fun, kind of fun version um, of, of Chinatown with all the pictures. And it seems like it, um, it, it, it's an example of how Chinatown became such a tourist destination after the earthquake. Yeah, well, it actually was one bef before one, but actually after one as well. So, this, you know, we, we, we know the story. 1906, earthquake hits San Francisco. It destroys virtually all the city. Uh, all the residents who had previously lived in San Francisco were evacuated to other towns in the Bay Area, especially to Oakland. Uh, and when the city was being rebuilt, many of the uh, original residents wanted to return. Um, many of the Chinese were told not to return <laughs> to these spaces here. But, but, but prior to that moment in time, there was certainly a kind of touristic culture within Chinatown, mm -hmm. and it became even more so after, after the earthquake. There are many debates about why it became touristic. Uh, one common argument is that the Chinese themselves understood the viability of their ability to stay in the, in the country meant um, becoming self-touristic, if that makes sense, right? To, to, to fashion themselves in a way that allowed for a certain kind of adventurous entertainment and um, uh, scrutiny of, of, their, mm -hmm. of their habitat. Okay, okay. so, right, I'll turn it for you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so this photograph is of a, a postcard um, that's next to the painting called The Good Team, and that's a painting that's part of the James collection um, of a, a father and a son, and uh, represents uh, one of the um, occupations that early Chinese immigrants had. Um, and uh, this came, this, the postcard was uh, found um, online. And so I had several different versions of the image that I was looking at and settled on this one. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great photograph. Um, yeah, it's a lithograph, as Emily says, it's a lithographic postcard based on an original glass plate negative. Uh, and I, I know this image from its original glass plate negative, and I'm so tickled to see it in its kind of colorized version here. Um, uh, I guess I would, I, I, I draw to this image for a number of reasons. One is that it is a kind of early, pre-1906 photographic fascination with the street culture of Chinatown. And one of the things to say is that after the 1869 completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, Chinatown, which had previously been a heavily populated, but one would not say overly congested neighborhood, 
became suddenly a very congested neighborhood, as all of those Chinese laborers working on the railroad across Nevada and Utah and other places suddenly returned to San Francisco. And the streets uh, became crowded. The buildings which once housed a rotating shift of men could no longer really house them adequately, and culture really spilled out into the streets. And so it's at that moment when there's really a kind of street culture of Chinatown. Uh, at the very same moment in time, it was the development of, as historians of photography like to say, the, the birth of photography, where suddenly cameras, which previously had been the domain of professional photographers, suddenly with, and you know the story, the Kodak camera <laughs> comes to be, and suddenly folks can purchase cameras and walk with these portable cameras and take their own pictures. Suddenly, Chinatown becomes a photographic attraction. And it's certainly the case in the late 1890s, photographers descended en masse to Chinatown and took picture after picture. And in, in this case, it was made by a local photographer, a man named Charles Wiedner, who fancied himself not just an amateur photographer, but one with aspiring professional ambitions. Um, and he took this photograph with a particular reason in mind, because he wanted to show his fellow amateur photographers what proper photography might be like at this day and age. So let me show you the original photograph that this postcard comes from. And here it is, right? Um, and you know, I, today I would say, and probably many of you would agree, it's not a very good photograph. Right? There are quite some problems with the photograph. And as, as good photographers will tell you, there are parts of it that are not particularly well controlled in terms of exposure. There are things that are, as photographers like to say, blown out, that is to say, overexposed, particularly that kind of section on the bottom lower left there. And yet, Wiedner insisted that this was something to teach his fellow amateurs about. And so he manipulated the photograph before it was to be published in a journal that, lo and behold, he edited called Camera Calf. And I want to show you how he edited the original photograph. Right? Uh, here is the journal Camera Craft from July. Actually, the photograph appears in the first issue in May. Right? This is a kind of uh, pretty typical example of the, uh, the journal itself. And I'm so struck by the manipulations between the original negative and what he sought to display to his fellow amateurs. And among the many things that strikes me is how that suddenly the overexposure is suddenly not overexposed anymore. <laughs> and he's taken a little pencil and he's drawn and he kind of covers it. And there's a wonderful kind of delineation of gray, the grayscale uh, in the photograph that eventually gets published here. So he was not above manipulating the photograph in any particular kind of way. So when it came time to release the photograph for an even wider distribution, than what was in camera calf in the postcard that Emily was able to get, he did some further alterations, right? And of the many kinds of things he did that I'm so struck by, number one, of course, he colorized the image. But I'm so struck by what he colorized in the image here, right? Uh, and so what event originally was hardly anything noticeable in the background behind the cobbler himself, which becomes the bright white of a rectangle in the camera craft rendition suddenly becomes this gigantic red thing <laughs> in the middle of the colorized version here. And there are many ways we might be able to interpret the reasons for that manipulation and the results of that manipulation. But to my eye, what it seems to suggest is that the streets themselves have become a decorated ornamental space full of colorful kinds of eye candy phenomena when in fact we know Chinatown with its overcrowding and overcongestion was a smelly and dark and dank and quite uncomfortable place to be in. And yet, one would never guess so from the image over on the left here. The other thing that sort of strikes me about the colorized version and the things he's done to help channel our attention is how what had previously been in the original, something like visual noise in the window behind the cobbler, which gets a little bit articulated in the middle photograph of the journal, suddenly becomes really well articulated in the back there. And I hope we can see in the colorized version 
that the shoes, after all, he's a cobbler making shoes, the, the shoes in the window are shoes for Chinese men, and the shoe that the man is working on on the street is actually shoes for a non-Chinese man. As if to say, the street culture versus the interior culture are two separate things. And the interior culture is one that's hidden away, kept behind the glass, and the street culture that's quite available to be seen is meant for the privilege and the kind of uh, observational survey of the visitors to these spaces here. Wow, well, yes. Well, and, and the postcard is meant for tourists. <laughs> this is the, 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 the sketch on the bottom says something like greetings and, and love from California. Um, and, and postcards became really popular around the turn of the century. And it was a way that people could, um, could send pictures. It's, a, it's like a first Instagram. <laughs> it's, it's um, so it was a, a little snapshot. It wasn't necessarily realistic, but it was a version. <laughs> okay, so I, I struggled with this image a little bit um, and whether to include aspects of the opium dens in the exhibition. And I, uh, I, I had a few objects that I could um, display. And when I found this postcard, um, I knew that I, I knew that it was part of the story, but it was a very specific perspective. So, and it was a very much a non-Chinese perspective, so. Yeah, right, right. So it's a, if you haven't had a chance to get to the exhibition, it's a, it's a relatively small image here. And it's uh, uh, near uh, by a vitrine, or maybe it's in the same mm -hmm. vitrine as the, the opium pipe itself there. Um, so we know a, a fair bit of the, um, how shall we say, the um, prurient interests in Chinatown, <laughs> which included the opium dens. Um, they were probably in existence long before the photograph had been made in the late 19th century, but increasingly became much more prevalent in the late 19th century here. And, and once again, this is a photograph by Charles Wiedner, our amateur uh, camera craft postcard photographer. Uh, and we probably could do the same thing with this photograph as we did with the previous photograph. Look at the original glass plate negative, make some comparisons between it and what he does in the colorized version. And I can show you the original photograph from which it comes. Um, uh, but rather than do that, I'd like to change the tactic slightly a little bit. And what I'm, when I look at the photograph over on the right, one of the things I'm so struck by is how it follows a certain kind of convention about picturing these most wanted spaces in Chinatown. They were dens that exist underground uh, and therefore were not available to the casual stroller of the street culture of Chinatown. And it took a pretty deliberate effort to get into the underground dens to take photographs of them. And when photographers, generally speaking, not amateur photographers, but professional photographers, ventured into the underground, they developed certain habits about how they pictured the place they found. And I wanted to show you the earliest known photographs we have from 1892 of what that picturing looked like. Um, they look surprised. <laughs> they they look a little caught off guard, don't they? They sure do. Uh, so the story is a man named Isaiah West Tabor, Tabor a man that Charles Weeder didn't really like very much, uh, uh, hired his own photographers to venture into Chinatown. Uh, and the story is, and we have a wonderful account of this, the, the, the photographer decides that he alone couldn't venture with this gigantic camera and tripod and magnesium powder flash to go. So he hired a whole series of people to come with him. And one would have thought, as a casual bystander of this activity, that all these other men were there to help him load and manipulate this enormous equipment. But in fact, they were there to break down doors <laughs> and push themselves into the underground opium dens to take a photograph of the space. And so there is this quality of surprise, right? There is this quality of intrusion and also, as you might imagine, there's also some photographic awkwardness in such a spontaneous encounter. And the photograph on the right, for example, captures one of the thugs, right? his hat, as he's kind of pushing his way into the den to allow the photographer to take a photograph. But one of the things that these early photographs did was to establish a kind of convention about how one encountered and particularly photographed 
these spaces here. So if I were to return to the photograph that's in the exhibition, right, and show you two other photographs, early, early photographs, we could probably, if we sat here long enough, to enumerate certain kind of commonalities about all of them. Right? The low ceiling, I see that. Right, absolutely right. So one of the things that almost all the photographers did was to register the fact that it was a low cramped ceiling in the space here. Um, frequently that low cramped ceiling had shards of paper that we can see on the bottom right that was beginning to peel and tear away from the wall. Uh, that became an object of incredible humor but also concern on the part of the photographers because when they used their magnesium powder flash to illuminate the scene, they often set the ceilings on fire when they did such things. And so they had to kind of, you know, pay attention to where these things were, and photographers built that attention into the making of the picture itself. The second thing I'm so struck by that these photographs share is that it tends to be, the formats tend to be vertical as opposed to horizontal. As if to say, one of the things, the experiences of the den was to be not only in a low cramped ceiling, but one that had almost a cave-like subterranean quality about them, as if they went on forever, it went on and on and on. Um, the third thing that strikes me about them is that always the photographers wanted to capture, or at least insist upon, the clutter of the scene, where there are all kinds of bric-a-brac everywhere. And even the photograph on the left, to my eye, one of the things that Wiedner does when he colorizes the version is to accentuate all the bric-a-brac mm -hmm. all over the place as well. Uh, and, and these were things that, you know, as I say, became conventions. And they tell a whole lot more about the people who venture into the space than the people who actually inhabit the space or take par partake of the space itself. Well, and it seems so sensational. And then to put it on a postcard, Yes. it, it, it just really, um, it just, continues to stereotype and, and just exaggerate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, other, the other thing too, even in the postcard, one can tell right on, is that there's a way in which the, the even in the colorized version, Wiener has made sure to brighten one of the walls and to leave a little bit faded the other wall. And to my eye, it was his uh, way of trying to accentuate the kind of flash that frequently the early photographs have, as if to say the flash was going to suggest something of the invasive nature of the photographic activity. You're intruding upon a space that was not prepared to receive you, and therefore what you're picturing has somehow a level and quality of authenticity of encounter about that, that he seems to want to insist over on the image on the left there. Mm. Um, and I guess I, I have a couple of other ones. Uh, one of the things that also I'm struck by in terms of the consistency of these photographs is that they understand and imagine the inhabitants of the underground dens to be almost entirely men. Uh, and I wondered about that because as we know, of course men went to the underground dens, but women went to the underground dens too. Um, and, and very infrequently were they pictured. In fact, we know Tabor, took a photograph of the women in the underground dens. And what's interesting about Tabor's early photograph is that there are non-Chinese women who are in the den there. Um, you know, I think the convention was to insist on their invisibility, if possible. But increasingly, we know that it wasn't just the Chinese who were inhabitants of the den, but many non-Chinese who were inhabitants of the den. Um, the numbers tell the story. You know, after the 1882 Exclusion Act, when the population of Chinatown was decreasing, we also know, ironically enough, at the very same time, the number of opium imports was increasing. <laughs> uh, and unless the remaining dwindling Chinese were smoking opium like locomotives day and night, <laughs> someone else was smoking the opium in the opium den, and we know it was visitors to the spaces there. Uh, and although the early photographs try to deny the existence of other smokers, it's clearly a source of anxiety among the police and among lawyers and among other folks who are concerned about the makeup, the demographic makeup of Chinatown itself here. They couldn't figure out why people wanted to go to these opium dens. And there's this wonderful police report from around this time. 
And a reporter's asking this police officer, well, you know, what is your experience of the inhabitants of these places? And he says something like, you know, I've seen a rich man who could, who could afford his own outfit, who could have his own opiate at home in the luxury of his own environs, not feel that was adequate unless he went to an opium den. And there's something about the anxiety in that report which suggests to us that it isn't just the drug that he wants, it's the experience of being in this space that he wants here. Uh, and so it's interesting to me that Wiedner insists on the homogeneity of the population of this space here, when in fact we know there was a far greater mixture. We also know that when, boy, when Hollywood got involved, and when dime novelists and fiction and pulp writers got involved, they explicitly upplayed what had previously been rigorously downplayed. <laughs> you know? And so let me show you. These are wonderful from 1899. The covers of pulp fiction from 1899 about what these opium dens are like. And I'm so struck by the fact that women appear in all of them. <laughs> and they're usually comatose. <laughs> they're usually lying in the bunks while there's kind of some raid of violence going on here, right? Uh, uh, and, and of course, you know, when, 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 as I say, when Hollywood gets involved in this, they don't want the kind of story that Wiedner and uh, Tabor are showing. They want these stories. And so I hope what I'm going to show you next might be familiar to some of you. When the great filmmaker D.W. Griffith got involved in the making of films, he produced something called Broken Blossoms. Uh, any folks here know this? piece at all here. Uh, it's the story of a Chinese man who falls in love with a non-Chinese woman. And much of it takes place within an opium den. And I'm going to show you just a film still from that, that film. Right? And, and, and there it is, right? Um, and I think one reason they so love to upplay what had previously been, been downplayed is that it somehow suggests the, um, the risque encounter of miscegenation. Right? and the ways in which uh, racial mixture was a source of tremendous anxiety and also, we might say, tremendous profit in this mm -hmm. case here. Right. Okay. So let me turn to this one. Okay. Okay, and um, this is the, the final image that we'll talk about today, but this is one of the paintings in the exhibition by Mian Situ called Convergence of Cultures. And um, this painting was borrowed from the Autry Museum of the American West, and uh, this was one of the first loans I was able to secure for the exhibition. Um, I loved the trio of women in this multicultural scene kind of walking toward the viewer, and I chose this um, in part because it was one that I, I knew the artist, I knew the artist's work, um, I knew it would be fabulous quality, and, um, and it was available, so that was part of it too. Um, but I, I loved emphasizing the women here. Um, it was really unusual for women to be walking along the street, and this is certainly a special scene. This is not an everyday kind of, of image. Um, this is a, more of a, a, a holiday with their dress, and uh, we have some pictures to back that up. So um, another photographer. So it, it's interesting that the um, that the the artists in the show often use early illustrations and photographs for inspiration for their work. Um, and uh, and we found this one at the Library of Congress. So it was it was really amazing. I had actually reached out to the artist uh, about this to to get his. Um, his take on it, and I didn't hear back from him before today, um, but, uh, but I, I have a feeling he probably took a look at this one because there's two women in the back with hats similar to uh, the striped dress uh, woman um, in the painting there. Yeah, it's a great painting. Yeah, so it's by a contemporary yes. uh, looking, looking back at this moment and trying to recall for contemporary viewers some of the stories that perhaps weren't told very much uh, in the 19th century. And the image you see over on the right is, is by a photographer named Arnold Goethe. And if your eyes are looking at this and they're trying to focus and they're saying, oh my goodness, my eye, I need to go back to the ophthalmologist. <laughs> in fact, it's, it, the, the original is quite blurry here. It was uh, not one of his more um, uh, polished efforts on the streets there. Um, I, I chose this as a last image, partly so I could hear the story. I, don't, I didn't know very much about this artist at all. It was wonderful to kind of get a sense of this. Um, but also because I'm, I'm so struck by the fact that, oh, by the way in which a contemporary artist tries to retell the story of the Chinese American experience in the 19th century. 
and how different it is from some of the early representations of precisely that experience. As Emily says, the painting on the left is one that imagines women on the street in a kind of fluid set of cultural encounters on the street. So we see on the kind of far left of the painting uh, a figure in you know, a bustle and a kind of fancy bourgeois hat, and I can imagine a parasol being swung around there. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if this was in Paris, we would call them you know, flanuses, and kind of wanderers on the streets there. Um, and what's so striking about it is that this, at least this contemporary painters imagines the social spaces of Chinatown to be one of fluid social encounters, where people, strangers, pass by each other quite unproblematically and quite casually and quite uh, uh, daily. Because we know that the early 19th century representations of street encounters in Chinatown were ones that tried vigorously to omit such casual encounters here. And I wanted to show you some of the early photographic examples of precisely that thing. We know, for example, the same photographer who made the photograph on the right also made this photograph here at the same time, one of his more famous photographs, which he called, and you'll love the title, uh, Slave Girl in Holiday Dress. Um, uh, and, I, and this is the original glass plate negative for that image. And you can probably tell that the original glass plate negative captures something of the fluidity of that social encounter, where there are people on the far left, for example, with their backs to us, who are probably non-Chinese, right? who are wandering through the streets. There's a woman with her bustle. We can imagine a parasol being twirled around. And over on the bottom right corner, I hope you can see there, there is another ghostly figure, or at least the detail of a ghostly figure, a long overcoat and, my goodness, a tripod. And so the photographer who takes the photograph is being accompanied by other photographers who are taking photographs of the scene. And we can imagine hordes of them wandering through these spaces. But when it came time for Gente to publish this photograph, he decided that the kind of casual social encounters that are pictured in the photograph needed to be edited. So in fact, he edits the scene. Uh, and what had been a more casual set of street experiences in the final version gets rigorously excised to suggest that somehow or other it's just a lone figure wandering through these spaces. And this wasn't the only time he ever did such a thing. One could imagine someone saying that, well, perhaps the photograph on the right isn't a very compositionally interesting photograph, so that the work on the left is, as a good photographer might do, composes the photograph in a particular kind of way to make it more aesthetically pleasing. But we also know that all of his other edits to other photographs are similarly rigorously excising of precisely those experiences. So let me show you a couple more. original photograph on the far left, right? followed by the published version in the middle. And in addition to making the figures bigger and the street closer to us, I'll have you pay attention to the very far back, where the horse and buggy on the very far back of the original gets cut off. And we can even see his grand efforts, and perhaps to our eyes, some of his clumsy efforts of trying to erase some of the photographs, some of the figures in the far back there. Right? Uh, and sometimes the erasures were successful, but with the photograph over on the right, sometimes the erasures were not very successful. So in fact, the, figure, the photograph on the right shows Chinese children walking along the streets along, oh my goodness, an American plumber's retail sign here with uh, the, the uh, proprietor of the space coming out of the door, a non-Chinese woman. And Gente says, she has to go. And he takes his little pencil and he tries to rub her out. Um, but he couldn't do it very successfully, and so the photograph remained unpublished. <laughs> uh, she looks like a ghost. <laughs> she does, she does look like a ghost, yep. Uh, and the plumber's sign, my goodness, I mean, it's hard to erase the plumber's sign, right? There, right? Um, and the most egregious, if I could go on one more time, sure. the most egregious version of this is this, um, this thing here, where the photographer himself, along with his many photographic companions as they entered into Chinatown, frequently took photographs of each other in these spaces here. 
And there is Arnold Gente himself. I hope we can see him. He's kind of the tall man standing up there, and he's got a Graflex camera by his belly there, and he's kind of toying with the camera, you know, and he's got his companion behind, beside him here. And I hope we see in the original photograph the mixture of people who are on the streets. Um, uh, once again, when it came time to publishing this photograph, he said, you know, something of that mixture has to go. And so he ends up editing it, right, down, and getting rid of, as we can see, the people on the far right there. But when it came time to publish this photograph in what was, at the time, post-1906, one of the very special celebrated volumes of pictures of old Chinatown after that area had been destroyed, he says, you know what, I'm going to picture myself as the maker of these images, and so I need to touch up this photograph even more. And here is the final version. I hope you get tickled out of this as I do, right? And even his buddy has to go. <laughs> and he's there by himself taking the scenes there. And there's something about the way in which that sense of self amidst others is one that has to be insisted on in a place like this here. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the collection of images I brought here for us. That's great, thank you for sure, that. Um, and, and this image and these examples uh, remind me of the recent uh, Edward Curtis photography installation that's in the early West Gallery. So the theme is photo manipulation. And Edward Curtis worked in this exact same time period. And it's very common uh, to have this, but to, uh, but to um, uh, pick and choose a little bit in how, um, how objects are represented in the space and, and which objects are represented in the space in that perspective. So a little bit of artistic license there. So take a look at that upstairs if you have any. Thank you very much, then. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, we've got some questions. <laughs> we open the floor to questions. Uh, thank you. On behalf of the audience, uh, you transported us into the streets of Chinatown with your narrative, and it's very much appreciated. A couple of questions. Um, were there competitive destinations to America or southeastern China? And if so, could you evaluate or any differences or differentiation of those destinations? And also, do you have any personal opinions on how the culture of Chinese immigrants was affected by the American experience in Chinatown? Right, okay, good questions. Um, so let me give you, yes, so the answer to the first question is that there, there are many competitive spaces, although San Francisco was the primary location of immigration, at least for much of the 19th century. And, and geographically, that makes sense to us. It's the closest port of entry from the eastern Chinese seaports there. Um, but to give you an extreme contrasting example, some Chinese wound up in the East Coast, and of all places, near where I teach, uh, North Adams, Massachusetts. Um, it's, it, today, I don't know how many folks have been, to, I mean, there's no reason to go to North Adams. I'm sorry for, <laughs> if you're from North Adams. There's, uh, uh, there, there's, there's a very small old factory town, but it was precisely its factory quality in the 19th century which drew laborers. And there was one um, shoemaker in North Adams, Massachusetts, who was fed up with white labor unions demanding certain kinds of pay and so he chartered a trainload of Chinese to come from across the West Coast, across the country, from a new, newly completed transcontinental railroad, and they settled in North Adams. And it was really a, 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 an opening up to many Chinese immigrants that there was possibilities elsewhere in the country. Um, and so there are very different kinds of settlements there. Uh, the, uh, in many cases, those other establishments were nearly understood as temporary workplaces from which they would leave at some point. Other locations were what we would imagine not just migrant centers, but immigrant centers, where, where um, men and sometimes families came to settle. Um, in New York, certainly, Boston, and, and other locations here. Um, to the second question about does, does the American experience change Chinese attitudes? And, and of course, we can imagine it varies from individual to individual. But at, at, at one extreme, we could say that 
for many Chinese men, and it was almost invariably Chinese men who came, but after all, they were the second and third and fourth sons of families. Um, you know, in, in a Confucian society of filial piety, where the family's uh, ethos is to sustain the family and to respect the elders and the father, um, it's a deep-seated Confucian philosophy, but it's one that's challenged in the United States. Right? Uh, and so there are many men who came who, although originally came with the intention of returning to China, uh, never do so, you know, and, and, and never want to do so after, the, uh, after their experience. And, and, and we can imagine a variety of reasons why they don't ever want to return to China. And so that, something of that, that filial piety, which is deep-seated, in, in, in the 19th century Chinese psyche is, is snapped uh, uh, from that experience. Uh, thank you for uh, braving the heat of Florida from Western <laughs> Massachusetts. Uh, full disclosure, I'm from Longmeadow, Massachusetts, nearby. So you touched briefly on the topic of Chinese exclusion the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Could you dive into a little more detail on how that survived for as long as it did in the United States? Yeah, so uh, um, uh, the, the first speaker in this uh, program was Jack Chen, who's a social historian based at Rutgers University, previously at NYU. And um, I feel a bit fraudulent because he would be the better person to answer, but I'll try. Um, uh, um, it, it was a, um, it, it lasted for an, so as long as it did. So it, for those of you who don't know the story, it, it was, uh, there was a long buildup until 1882 to exclude the Chinese. Between 1869 and the ending of the building of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1882, there was increasing anger on the part of white labor unions for the competition they faced with suddenly unemployed Chinese railroad workers. Um, and um, they took to the ballot box uh, they organized into labor unions and they pressured politicians to exclude the Chinese. Um, and it's as simple as that. Uh, um, when the Chinese were excluded, um, there was a slight uptick in opportunities for white laborers and labor unions, not nearly enough to satisfy the demand. Um, and so over time, the Exclusion Act, which was originally imagined to be for just 10 years, was renewed in 1892, and then again in the early 20th century, and it remained in effect until, my goodness, the middle of the 20th century, you know, like a, a good 70 year span in practice, if not in law. Um, and there are many reasons over that time why the Exclusion Act was continually renewed. One had to do with the demands of white labor. Right? One had to do with the demands of certain kinds of um, political anxieties over the transformation of China itself. Um, and in particular, we might say in the middle of the 20th century um, when Mao Zedong becomes the premier of China, that that anxiety reaches a certain kind of a geopolitical tension as well. Um, uh, um, as I say, it varies considerably. Uh, the acts themselves are not all the same. The, uh, in the initial acts made for provisions that allowed for wealthier Chinese to arrive to facilitate business exchanges and excluded laborers. Uh, but that, that changed, that class dimension changed over time. And we can imagine the differences for those changes. I hope that answers. Good. And also let me say, it's, it, it is very warm here. <laughs> it's very, it's quite humid here. I'm, I'm used to like brutal cold Decembers in, 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 in Massachusetts and it's really quite wonderful here. Thank you. <laughs> So here in St. Petersburg, Florida, African Americans were redlined and kept in the south part of St. Petersburg for many, many decades. And so was something similar happening in San Francisco that led to the crowded conditions where Chinese persons were made to stay in certain designated neighborhoods? Um, yes, uh, both legally and illegally. So we can imagine the illegal versions taking place where there are certain kinds of you know, physical violence. Right? And, 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 and we have many reports of physical violence and, and, and intimidation 
on the part of non-Chinese for the Chinese. But there were also legal organ ordinances and, and legal kinds of things that went on and ways of, of quarantining, quarantining Chinatown as a kind of closed, non-fluid community. Um, uh, the, the map I showed you from the 1890s, might remember that one that shows the kind of brothels and the opium dens itself. Um, that was, in fact, among the many purposes for that map was to delimit the physical boundaries of Chinatown as a set encounter, as a set boundary, when in fact we know there was a bit more spillage than that. But it was a way of trying to legislate a physical boundary around a space like that. Um, um, the, the legal ordinances are um, ones that we're probably very familiar with today, right? Um, you, you can't buy in certain neighborhoods, right? <laughs> you, you can't cooperate or work in certain neighborhoods. Uh, you can't uh, um, have opportunities in certain neighborhoods. And so it kind of bound the space in all kinds of ways. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. You mentioned earlier that uh, Chinatown was established in kind of the least desirable places of San Francisco. For some reason, and I guess I was read something incorrectly, I was under the impression that after the earthquake, when the town was virtually lost to fire, etc., that the city fathers in San Francisco wanted to give those that lived in Chinatown and did business there another area of San Francisco that was considered really almost like swampland because they said that Chinatown had one of the premier positions where if you're in Chinatown, you could look out and see San Francisco Bay. And they tried like the Dickens to get the Chinese to consider that and to move and it didn't happen, but that's a little bit of a digression from what you said, which sounds like from the get-go, they were in the bad spaces. Right, right. So, so in the 19th century, prior to the earthquake, um, the area they inhabited was one that was cast off land. It was, it was frequently made up of pretty poorly constructed wooden buildings um, that, if you know the story of early San Francisco, constantly caught on fire and were continually being burnt down and rebuilt. And sometimes they were rebuilt in the most slapdash versions you can possibly imagine. Um, uh, and, and, it, and, and for many wealthy San Franciscans, that was a neighborhood to leapfrog, and if you know the terrain of San Francisco, to go up the hill uh, to what is today called Knob Hill, uh, where Mark Hopkins and uh, various other railroad magnates built their very palatial mansions. But one of the things they didn't reckon with was to get from the docks to Knob Hill, you had to pass through Chinatown. <laughs> and so what had once been kind of cast off land, over time came to seem economically really important <laughs> because it was the space that people had to pass through to get through that neighborhood. So you're right on. In 1906, after the earthquake, when uh, the city is being rebuilt, those entrepreneurs who had a very vivid memory of the, des the, the sudden desirability of that old neighborhood did not want the Chinese to return to that space. And they, um, they, they offered a space that was in the south of the city. So for those of you who are sports fans, you might know uh, Candlestick Park in San Francisco, which is where the baseball team plays and other things happen. That, that's a marshy land there. They wanted to put, they wanted to put the Chinese over there. And it's, it's kind of this wonderful modern day story. The Chinese refused to do that. And so they suddenly and almost immediately appeared after the earthquake in tents and did a modern day squat <laughs> and stayed in the neighborhood that had, was, was originally their neighborhood. And they kind of refused to leave in that space and they, they couldn't be pushed out. Any other questions? So I have a curiosity, you're mentioning North Adams, Massachusetts, and made me think of the real difference between the earlier immigration wave of laborers, uneducated for the most part, you know, and um, 
they spoke um, Guananhua, right? They, and then later, much like more recently, and I think of Harvard and that whole area, it's all the model immigration wave. And they mostly speak Mandarin, right? And the clash, and I can see that in these Chinatowns still today, when I visit, it's all in Guanajuato. It's all in Cantonese. So how has that affected sort of these communities? Is there just not a lot of mixture in these Chinatowns because of this long time? It's a very different sort of educational background, language background, and I still see that differentiation when I go to the, the communities. So here's maybe I'll, I'll give a plug for the third of the speaker series with uh, Ian Shen, who's coming from the University of Michigan, who, who I got, understand is going to be speaking mostly about the kind of contemporary Chinese American experience and the communities there, right? Yeah. Uh, and I don't know Professor Shen personally, but I, I imagine it's going to be kind of a wonderful kind of dive into that. Um, I would say so. You're right on um, the, the 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 linguistic shift uh, from old Chinatown to contemporary Chinatown is pretty noticeable. Although if you go to certain neighborhoods, you can still hear you know, Cantonese spoken pretty, pretty fluidly and fluently. Um, um, and I would imagine it's, you know, um, the, the, the relationships differ over, between different demographic populations here. Uh, and and certainly, there are certainly class divisions. Um, but I would say that today's class divisions are not just today's class divisions. Uh, in the 19th century, there were also very, very strong class divisions among the Chinese community. Um, and many of the laborers who came to China, to, to the States, did so under labor contracts. Um, the, the, the second and third and fourth sons of farming families couldn't necessarily afford the passage across the Pacific Ocean. But to afford passage, what they would do is sign contracts with uh, labor companies that would front them the money and in return require years of servitude in response to that. And we, I hope we already feel in that kind of um, negotiation a class distinction between those who are having to indenture themselves to the labor companies and those who are operating the labor companies. And, and one of the things that's frequently um, not told about the Chinese American experience in the 19th century is that the opium epidemic, which had certainly existed in China prior to the immigration experience, was one as, as much facilitated by the Chinese as it was by the non-Chinese. Um, one of the beliefs, among many, was that uh, in order to keep the indentured laborers indentured, was to keep them within a kind of closed economic system, very similar to what we would imagine the 19th century American factory towns as, 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 as a factory towns where the laborers in those factory towns would buy their foodstuffs from factory stores, uh, rent their buildings and the places of abode from factory owners, and so that their economic livelihood was entirely dependent on the factory itself. And Chinese laborers were doing the same thing, but in this case, they would buy their opium from Chinese manufacturers, right? <laughs> who kept them in their debt, and so they had a hard time actually paying off the um, money that was fronted to them in the first place. And so opium became kind of this means of, um, how should we put it? Um, slavery. slavery, yeah, suppression, right? Mm -hmm. Oppression, right? Yeah. And it was frequently done by the Chinese themselves in that situation. That doesn't quite answer the question. <laughs> but, but yeah, coming to the next. Yeah, coming to the next, yeah. <laughs> To carry on your just comment, um, you showed a picture of a slave girl. Was that um, an indentured, or was there an actual slave trade? Um, so um, we we don't know the identity of this particular woman, um, uh, but we can imagine the. Uh, imagined identities foisted onto her <laughs> uh, and the ways that um, and we should say this about virtually any unescorted woman on the streets of San Francisco the ways in which their very appearance on the streets could be sexualized 
right, and to be eroticized in some ways. Uh, the, the San Francisco was not alone in this, in, in Paris at the same time. Any un, unescorted woman was frequently thought to be simply a sex trade up, uh, a sex worker. Um, and in this case, um, many San Francisco photographers and certainly pulp fiction writers played up that identity. Um, it's very likely that she was the um, daughter or wife of a merchant, right? And she's wearing a, an outfit that isn't a daily outfit, but in fact is an outfit that was meant for particularly special occasions. Uh, um, New Year's, for example, uh, Chinese New Year, uh, or other kinds of things. And it was not at all unheard of for camera clubs to descend in Chinatown in mass during these ritual days to take photographs of, of, the, of the people who are wandering the streets there. Um, so to, to answer your question, we don't know who she is or what her occupation might be, but the, but the very odds are that she was not a slave girl <laughs> in any of those ways there. Yeah. Yeah. Questions? Yeah, briefly, um, to what extent did the Chinese community self-segregate for self-interested economic purposes um, in terms of kind of creating a, a client base for among themselves? And to what extent do you think that was created by the, let's say, the the bigotry of the community, the larger American community, that it pretty much required them to do that? Or do you think it was something they kind of preferred? Do you have a comment about that? Sure, so um, uh, I think it changes over time. Right? Um, in the early 19th century, very soon after the, around 1850 into the 1860s, um, uh, there was a great concern among San Francisco businessmen that Chinatown was operating as, operating as a kind of um, um, singular economic unit. Uh, there's this wonderful phrase by some of the newspaper editors, uh, uh, and they're trying to be polite when they say this. They say, well, the Chinese are generous among themselves, uh, which is meant to suggest, and if we dig a little deeper into that anxiety, they just don't trade with anybody else. Right? <laughs> they don't buy and sell. Um, um, and, and, and certainly that's the case early on. Um, but we also know that by the 1860s or so, that kind of uh, real or imagined um, interiority is not possible anymore, right? And there's a way in which any, as we know today, any kind of economic unit must be one that has lots of fluidity in, in it. Um, um, uh, the, there are also some wonderful stories uh, that suggests that the Chinese themselves preferred certain kinds of things that they either interpreted or in fact understood to be only available to them by other Chinese. And there's, uh, to go back to our North Adams example here, um, when the Chinese men were contracted by the shoemaker to come and work in the factory, they specifically demanded, much to the chagrin of the shoemaker himself, Chinese grown as opposed to American grown rice. So this shoemaker who you know was having to kind of cut corners and kind of trying to avoid too much economic outlay had to agree to import bags and bags and bags of Chinese grown rice to fill the, 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 the needs and demands of, of his Chinese workers. I don't know whether Emily or you could answer this, but that very first slide of the Harper's Weekly from 1876, and as you said, it was probably in the bowels of the ship. They were having a, essentially a fire there it was probably very unrealistic. It looks like a nice, friendly RV gathering to me. Do we have any idea of who did this? Who was the individual that 
put this together because Harper's Weekly was so prevalent with doing things and portraying things that were happening in the West. And did they take that kind of license? I mean, does anybody know? <laughs> they, they took a lot of license. Um, but we know that the, uh, the artist has the initials of A.H. That's at the bottom. But we don't, I don't know anything else about who might have, have made it. So, and, and do you know the publisher? I think, I, I want to say we know, but I don't, I don't. Yeah. So, so Har Harper's, Harper's was a New York-based, New York-based magazine, uh, and they had in-house artists, and also in-house, uh, uh, we would call them uh, engravers, right? Uh, and they're not necessarily the same people. Uh, and so AH, uh, in this case, might refer to the original artist, or it might refer to the engraver of the work. We're not really sure. Um, but uh, in terms of the known artists at, uh, at Harper's, none of them have the initials A.H. <laughs> so we don't really know for sure. Um, but Harper's did take lots of license with things. And in fact, one of the ongoing debates at Harper's uh, and magazines like them, not necessarily about the Chinese, is how the engravers would take liberties with what the artists would provide them. Uh, and, and the most um, egregious examples of those have, have very little to do with the Chinese. In fact, um, the Civil War, uh, the American Civil War, um, uh, was one that was very heavily covered by the New York journals, uh, and they illustrated the things that they were reporting on. And in fact, they would send out sketch artists into the war front and the battle front uh, who, you know, very laboriously and enthusiastically would return and send back sketches from the, the battlefront to Harper's, only to find that what they sent back would be so severely edited at the editorial offices that they would complain vociferously, and, and we know how it works today, right, to, 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 on completely deaf ears <laughs> about, about what they produced in these images. So yeah, this is, this is uh, totally within their aesthetic. <laughs> Oh, okay. So, I so, see it's like a tablecloth of people be, be, you know, eating there. I see water. I don't see any fire anywhere. Can, can folks see where, where we're? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, I you, don't. Like, yeah. You know, I, I, I zoom in and I see it's like a tablecloth of everybody. I think you think the tablecloth is the fire. Right. So, uh, there is, is there a pointer There's on it? Yeah, right in the center. Yeah, because I looked and I, you know, in there. Yeah, no, but it doesn't look like there it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, yeah. and, and, and here is the uh, raw ingredients <laughs> for the fire, right? Yeah. Um, and the other wonderful thing about this, I, we didn't mention this before, um, you know, the, the, the Chinese workers, when they came to the States, um, gained reputations as uh, laundrymen. Um, uh, and it was uh, a um, profession in many locations foisted upon them. But according to the Harper's rep representation, they seem to have brought that attitude with them <laughs> when, they, when they show up across the Pacific Ocean here, right? Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. In communities that have a commonality, over time they tend to expand and contract. Uh, it, I get the impression is the boundaries of Chinatown at that time were fairly well defined, as you showed with, with your maps. Was there a tendency for uh, people to, to migrate out of those boundaries and expand the area over time? Um, uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I can tell you my own, my own experience. Uh, my, my parents are immigrants, uh, and I was born and raised in Chinatown. Um, uh, but like many immigrants of my parents' generation, when they got a little bit of money, uh, they moved out of Chinatown. And if you know anything about San Francisco, um, where you want to move is west, right? And so they moved out to what is today called the Avenues. I don't know if folks know the area uh, in San Francisco. And so my folks moved into the Avenues. And I was not, that was not unique among, um, among my generation or their generation. We all kind of moved out of the city there. Um, and, and so yes, there was this continual expansion away from what had once been the kind of locale of Chinatown. And that particularly became the, 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 the norm 
when the demographic of Chinatown shifted between what was originally a, a kind of primarily male population to one that was uh, which included one which included uh, mothers and wives and children, and, and that those families moved out of the neighborhood of Chinatown. Um, and, and you know, and, and um, it, it is uh, although although it was a much desired place, Chinatown itself, it was also a ghetto. Right? It was a, it was a uh, the, the word that was frequently used in the middle of the 20th century was that it was a gilded ghetto, uh, meaning that it had this kind of strange. Uh, almost contradictory quality about it, where for the folks who lived there, it was really kind of a slum, really. Um, but for those who visited there, it was kind of this wonderful kind of experience, this kind of, you know, jazzy, touristic kind of space there. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for joining us. It's a great discussion. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it.